scribes, we need you to lead us by Seth Godin. This book is packed with potent snippets of wisdom and insight for those who have a heart to initiate change in any organization or tribe of people. I love reading Seth because we share a love for leaders of all stripes and backgrounds, helping leaders to get unstuck, to begin again, to get re-inspired and re-engaged in making an impact that matters in our ever-changing world. How does Seth define a tribe? A tribe is a group of people connected to one another, connected to a leader, and connected to an idea. For millions of years, human beings have been part of one tribe or another. A group needs only two things to be a tribe, a shared interest and a way to communicate. We live in an age where communication has never been easier with fewer filters and speed bumps for getting the message out. This makes building your own tribe easier than ever. You don't have to ask permission, you just need to communicate and connect with those who share your passion. There are more tribes and groups and circles of interest than ever before just waiting to be led. There are plenty of followers. We need you to lead them. What is the thesis of this book? For the first time ever, everyone in an organization, not just the boss, is expected to lead. The very structure of today's workplace means that it's easier than ever to change things and that individuals have more leverage than ever before. The marketplace is rewarding organizations and individuals who change things and create remarkable products and services. It's engaging, thrilling, profitable, and fun. Most of all, there is a tribe of fellow employees or customers or investors or believers or hobbyists or readers just waiting for you to connect them to one another and lead them where they want to go. There's a major difference between the leaders we need today and the old school management styles of the past that are more ineffective than ever. Management is about manipulating resources to get a job done. Burger King franchises hire managers. They know exactly what they need to deliver and they're given resources to do it at low cost. Managers manage a process they've seen before and they react to the outside world, striving to make that process as fast and as cheap as possible. Leadership, on the other hand, is about creating change that you believe in. Leaders have followers. Managers have employees. Managers make widgets. Leaders make change. Change is frightening. And to many people who would be leaders, it seems more of a threat than a promise. So why do people settle for the status quo? Why don't people lean into change? Why is change so scary? Because in a stable world, it's great to be king. Lots of perks, not a lot of hassles. Kings have always worked to maintain stability because that's the best way to stay king. They've traditionally surrounded themselves with a well-fed and well-paid court of supplicants, each of whom has a vested interest in keeping things as they are. The monarchy has had a huge impact on the way we see the world. Kings taught us about power and about influence and about getting things done. A king assembles his own geographically based tribe and has power to enforce compliance from royalty we learned how to build corporations, and from royalty, we learned how to build nonprofits and other organizations as well. Long live the king. Corporations are traditionally built around the CEO with all his perks and power. The closer you get to being king, CEO, the more influence and power you have. The goal of the corporation is to enrich the king and keep him in power. In today's world, stability is an illusion, Consider Saddam Hussein, Idi Amin, Bashar al-Assad, Osama bin Laden. Crimes against humanity, crimes against the rights of man aren't tolerated anymore. Positions of power are not impenetrable anymore. These men had movements and power, but not sustainable stability. Top-down Machiavellian leadership isn't as effective anymore because the common man has been empowered to make changes from the bottom up without permission. All bottom-up movements, good, bad, and ugly, share some common denominators. The movement happens when people talk to one another, when ideas spread within the community, and most of all, when peer support leads people to do what they always knew was the right thing. Seth quotes Senator Bill Bradley, who defines a movement as having three elements. One, a narrative that tells the story about who we are and the future we're trying to build. Two, a connection between and among the leader and the tribe. Three, something to do. The fewer limits, the better. Seth comments, too often organizations fail to do anything but the third. 
Seth Godin learned to lead from the bottom when he was 24 years old. He joined a software company and was assigned to ship educational software by Christmas. Seth's project was bigger and more complex than he could pull off, so he was forced to create a movement around his assignment because he had no leverage in the organization. Soon, however, Seth figured out how to engage and mobilize everyone in the organization around his project. How did Seth pull it off? Well, you need to pur purchase the book to find out. I'm not revealing all of Seth's secrets in this summary. Uh, so it is worth the price of admission. Go buy it and read it for yourself. Well, what are some nuggets from Seth? Leaders who set out to give are more productive than leaders who seek to get. As the ability to lead a tribe becomes open to more people, it's interesting to note that those who take that opportunity and those who succeed most often are doing it because of what they can do for the tribe, not because of what the tribe can do for them. Initiating is really and truly difficult, but that's what leaders do. Seth defines sheepwalking as the outcome of hiring people who have been raised to be obedient and giving them brain-dead jobs and enough fear to keep them in line. The key elements in creating a micro-movement consist of five things to do. One, publish a manifesto. Two, make it easy for your followers to connect with you. Three, make it easy for your followers to connect with one another. Four, realize that money is not the point of the movement. Five, track your progress. So what are the elements of leadership? Leaders challenge the status quo. Leaders create a culture around their goal and involve others in that culture. Leaders have an extraordinary amount of curiosity about the world they're trying to change. Leaders use charisma in a variety of forms to attract and motivate followers. Leaders communicate their vision of the future. Leaders commit to a vision and make decisions based on that commitment. Leaders connect their followers to one another. They don't have to be in charge or powerful or pretty or connected to be a leader. You do have to be committed. The secret of Ronald Reagan is to listen, to value what you hear, and then to make a decision even if it contradicts the very people you are listening to. Reagan impressed his advisors, his adversaries, his voters by actively listening. People want to be sure you heard what they said. They're less focused on whether or not you do what they said. Part of leadership. A big part of it, actually, is the ability to stick with the dream for a long time. Long enough that the critics realize that you're going to get there one way or another, so they follow. Flynn Berry wrote that you should never use the word, quote, opportunity. It's not an opportunity. It's an obligation. I don't think we have any choice. I think we have an obligation to change the rules, to raise the bar, to play a different game, and to play it better than anyone has any right to believe is possible. There's no record of Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi whining about credit. Credit isn't the point. Change is. So what are you waiting for? Who is your tribe and what are you doing to tighten and lead your tribe? The greatest waste of time is the time it takes for you to get started. So write it down and do something. Bye for now.